calendar should be logging in and then we'll be able to. I didn't receive any notice about him not being in attendance today. Well, Andy, is there? There are no decision items here today, right? We won't be making any decisions at this meeting. That is correct. Um, but as I think Sarah's online now. I'm not sure if we're able to move forward without a quorum. Oh, there's Bob Absolutely. anyway, so no problem. Um, I think we're recording. Hey, Bob. All right, Chad, I will hand it over to you. All right, very good. So I'll call to order uh, the meeting of the Mitigation Advisory Committee today on April 20, April 9th of 2024. We'll start with a uh, roll call and approval of the agenda. Then we'll move to the consent agenda, which consists of the March meeting minutes. So with that, I'll hand it over to Andy to conduct roll call. All right, thank you, Chad. Um, please respond. I'm going to do a roll call for names. Please respond in the affirmative if you're present. Uh, Chad Washington. Here. Bob Salinger. I am here. I'm going to have to switch to cell phone at some point and get on the road. So you'll, at some point you'll see me disappear and reappear. Thank you. Uh, Kristen Rivard. Heath Curtis. If you're on mute for that. I'm here. Uh, Fran Capra. Here. Andrew Perkey. Mark Stern. Here. Mark Grenbremer. Jennifer Weichel. Here. Kate Wells. Here. Chris Allen. Sarah Gregory. Here. Thank you. Um, all right, Chad, we do have a quorum for the members, so we can move forward. All right, very good. Has everyone had a chance to review the agenda? And if so, are there any requests for changes or modifications before we move forward? OK. Hearing none, uh, we will approve the agenda as presented and move to the consent agenda, uh, which consists of the meeting minutes from the March meeting. I've taken the time to review those minutes and feel like they are well represented. Has everyone else had the chance to review those meeting minutes? And if so, any concerns or requests for corrections? I have one suggestion. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. You know, there's a lot of uh, substance that goes down in all the meetings, and it's hard to really um, track that content in the meeting minutes per se. But I think the meetings are recorded, so it'd be great to have a link to the recordings for the meetings in the minutes. Just if mm. someone wanted to go back through and find things, that will be there, there in the package. Good suggestion, Mark. That should be easy enough to accomplish. No problem. Can you uh, make note of that, Andy? Yep, we'll put that in the next one. Thank you for bringing that up. Great idea. Well, with that, we will move to public comment. Andy, did we have anyone uh, request public comment? Um, yes, at this time uh, we will open up the floor for public comment. Uh, if you'd like to have any, please raise your hand virtually so we can see it and we'll call on you. You'll have three minutes for each comment period. Very good. And you'll track the, uh, the times there, Andy? Correct. All right, very good. Well, it looks like we have someone with their hand up. Carson, if that's how you pronounce your name. Um, if not, I'm sorry, but please feel free. That's correct. Thank you. Um, Chair Washington, Vice Chair Rivard, and members of the committee, thank you so much for being here today. My name is Carson Kendrick, and I'm the Conservation Program Manager at the Coalition of Oregon Land Trusts. I'd like to start today by offering my congratulations on the recent funding recommendations made by this committee at the March meeting. It has been truly a pleasure to watch this grant program develop under your guidance and expertise. 
CULT is a membership organization and we represent 31 land trusts, soil and water conservation districts and conservation organizations working across Oregon to protect our habitat and natural spaces. Collectively, our members have protected more than 290,000 acres of land in our state. Land trust work is rooted in local community needs and partnerships with state and federal agencies, watershed councils, tribes, and many more. Our members work closely with these partners to protect and restore habitat in ways that advance the goals of the Oregon Conservation Strategy, protect working farm, ranch, and forest land, support local economies, and build resilience to the impacts of climate change. As this committee undertakes the development of the land and easement acquisition pathway for the mitigation grant fund, our land trust community stands ready to achieve the same goals envisioned by the committee and the private forest accords and deliver high quality protection and restoration projects that mitigate impacts to covered species in the habitat conservation plan. Our members also work across Washington and Oregon and can share valuable input from their experience in managing land, implementing collaborative restoration projects, and combining funds from a variety of sources to do both. I just wanna thank you for your great work to date. Our members look forward to collaborating with you as you further develop uh, the grant application and review process for this part of the program. Uh, thank you so much. Very good. Thank you for the comment, Carson. Appreciate that. Was there anyone else that requested public comment, Andy? Um, we had some public comments submitted and posted online. Other than that, this is an opportunity for any additional public comment. Please feel free to unmute and raise your hand. I don't see anything at this time, Chad. All right, Andy, I think we'll go ahead and move forward then. So next we've got the staff report, so I'll hand it back to you for that, Andy. Great, just a quick second. All right, everyone, uh, afternoon now. Um, so I mean, I have a brief staff report today, just some updates. I know we have a lot of discussion ahead of us, so I won't take up too much of the time. Um, just want to talk about some high, uh, a few touch points. Um, so I have notified all uh, presumptive grantees of the, the award that we plan to go in front of commission on April 19th. Um, we have talked to all grantees, all have accepted except one. The Pheasant Creek Fish Passage Project was denied due to some circumstances. Other than that, we'll be moving forward with the 25 recommended projects for funding to commission on April 19th. Total comes out to about 100, uh, 100, no, it was 10 million, 9,000 and some change there. A uh, quick update on outreach ahead of our next solicitation offering in fall of this year in 2024. Uh, we are continuing to engage um, you know, with our target applicants and those groups that we do wish to increase applications from. Uh, anyone on this call or any of the committee members, as you know about outreach and engagement opportunities, feel free to reach out to me um, and I'm always able to get out there, but we already have some stuff scheduled for summer um, leading up to our solicitation. So we're really excited about hopefully more engagement this year. Last thing I want to touch on ahead of today's discussion about acquisition, a quick reminder that last year the committee decided to postpone the acquisition component of our program to allow for more time to develop a re more robust process. Uh, the goal was then to potentially include it in year two, which brings us to our discussion today. Um, today we'll be having, uh, we'll start with Miriam Forney, the Acquisition Coordinator at OWEB, and Renee Davis, the OWEB Acquisitions and Special Programs Manager. They'll be joining us to provide valuable insights on the acquisition process through a Q&A discussion back and forth. Um, and just some key points as we kind of have today's discussion, um, a little bit of a timeline I wanted to paint for all of us. We need a draft of the acquisition process by late spring, early summer to include it in this year's solicitation. Um, so beyond defining acquisition priorities and allowed types of our solicitation, we also need to solidify the review process for proper evaluation, reviewers, and of course, the scoring and acquisition of acquisition proposals. All right, Chad, I'm going to hand it back to you unless there's some other questions. Like I said, I just wanted to keep my staff report brief. Um, yeah, thank you. I appreciate that, Andy. Uh, I would also just like to mention that uh, Kristen and I will also be going in front of the commission to present the a uh, slate of potential projects to be funded. I think that's an important note from the committee, so we will be representing us there. Um, 
Looks like Mark, you've got your hand up. Do you want to take a minute? Yeah, hey Andy, can you refresh us just what the timeline is for the next RFP when it goes out? Um, of course. Um, so we're looking at pushing it ahead a month. I actually proposed a brief timeline just last month. I wrote one up. I believe we're looking at October 1 as a launch day, opening the solicitation and closing it on November 30 of this year. Um, and then kicking off into the review process thereafter. So it should follow a similar timeline when it comes to awards and everything in the spring of next year with commission. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Yeah. And Andy, just to reiterate the points that you've made there, uh, that we have agreed to potentially include acquisitions in the second solicitation. Uh, that's not a, a commitment and there is, you know, a lot of reason to take our time during this process to make sure we do it right the first time which will be easier than trying to walk back uh, a rushed process. So to inform that process, I think the next presenter we have here um, is Miriam from OWEB. And yes, Renee we have, there we go. Yeah, Miriam, we have uh, Miriam Forney and Renee Davis. Great, good afternoon. Thanks, Chair Washington, members of the committee. I'm Renee Davis. OWEB's Acquisitions and Special Programs Manager. The real expert is Miriam Forney, so we'll um, have some opportunity to walk through some of the questions that Andy provided, um, I think based on past discussions among ODFW staff and among the committee about the acquisitions program that you're contemplating. Um, and we're happy to share expertise based on uh, many years of implementing an acquisitions program at OWEB. Before I turn it over to Miriam um, to dive into some of the details, just a bit of framing. So in terms of OWEB's land acquisition program, this is founded in two ballot measures, Measure 66 from 1998, Measure 76 from 2010. Um, parks and natural resources were covered within that ballot measure. We're talking about the natural resources side of the ballot measure. So real strong focus on restoration and protection of native fish and wildlife, species and their habitats, water quality and stream flow. Um, so in terms of the land acquisition program that Miriam's been administering for, I don't know, 15 years, probably something like that. Not exactly sure how long. Um, the intent is to focus on long-term protections of lands um, within the state of Oregon that, that get at those um, protection and restoration needs for significant habitats for native fish and wildlife species. We do work with willing owners um, in terms of the acquisitions program, and that's true on the land acquisition side and also the water acquisition side at the agency. The agency did establish land acquisition priorities many years ago, and those hit on a whole host of, of different aspects of um, connectivity, restoring proper um, ecological function and process, protecting large intact areas, so really grounded in some key ecological priorities. Um, in terms of the timeline, we're at um, just over 25 years of investment in land acquisitions um, with OWEB funding. Um, that's protected nearly 90,000 acres. Um, we have a mix of both fee simple projects, so 77 fee simple projects totaling, it's actually about 90 properties covered within those. And we also do have easement projects, and I think this program may have more of an emphasis on easements. I quickly looked at the um, the bill language. So we have 21 conservation easement projects and um, all told about $58 million in investment in land acquisitions with approximately $97 million in matching funds. Um, so I mentioned that just in terms of the land acquisition piece, we do at OWEB have multiple land and water transaction programs. So kind of the traditional Measure 76 program that Miriam will be focusing on we do have the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program, which is a dual benefit program, ecological benefit and, and viable ag operations that is a focus on easements and covenants. We have a water acquisition program at OWEB, and then we have an in-development drinking water source protection program that's um, quite different. We're in rulemaking right now, so more to come on that program. Um, so Miriam will be an amazing resource with background about some of what we work through related to priorities, how the process works, timeline, eligible applicants. Um, also, I know that the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program exists at ODFW, so I'm not sure if the committee has tapped into that, but it could also be a fantastic resource. So I think with that, Andy, I would 
you know, invite you to kind of guide us through the questions as you see fit in terms of the committee. It does look like Heath has a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, we'll kind of hand off to Heath, but yeah, we have some questions that uh, that we can get to, but Heath, feel free to take it away. And thank I you, Renee, for a, that background. I have a vocabulary question for you, uh, Renee. The, the, the vocabulary question is, you talk about, I think you said land acquisition program, and is it correct to style beneath that conservation easements and fee simple acquisitions? That is to say, you would style both of those as components of a, a land acquisition program at OWEB. Is that yeah. correct? That's correct, Heath. And Miriam will talk a little bit about the fact that there are kind of multiple prongs within the land acquisition program that Miriam is focused on. One note that I would mention is, for example, with the Oregon Agricultural Heritage Program that I mentioned, that actually does not include fee simple that is focused on conservation easements and covenants. So each one of our land transaction programs has a slightly different flavor based in the fact that each one has a different statutory foundation. So we'll be focused on um, both fee and conservation easement under the kind of traditional measure 76 land acquisition program for the purposes of the conversation today. Helpful, thank you. Absolutely. Renee, if I may, so you're saying that the statutory authority is what determines what the program looks like. And so for the Oregon Agricultural Heritage one that is focused on conservation easements and thus dictates kind of the structure of the program. Correct. Great. Thank you for that. Well, I appreciate that. Um, and I think um, unless Miriam, you wanted to start off another way. Um, I know one of the main questions that I think has been revolved around is talking about effectiveness of um, acquisition and how you can really measure the benefit of that. Um, that might be something that I, I'd at least appreciate hearing a little bit more about how you guys measure effectiveness um, short and long term. Uh, good afternoon, all. Um, I'm glad to be here. Andy, thank you very much for inviting Ren Renee and I to, to talk with you uh, today. Uh, for the record, I'm Miriam Forney. I am OWEB's Land Acquisition Coordinator. I have been uh, working with land acquisitions for about 17 years now, most of the time at OWEB. Uh, Andy, I'd be glad to, to uh, attempt to provide some information about how we approach um, monitoring and outcomes. Um, I think to best get at some information for you, I should first provide some context, um, mentioning OWEB's approach to evaluating grant applications because there, there is a connection there. Um, our, our process is robust and it hinges on five uh, criteria, which are ecological outcomes, project soundness, um, organizational capacity, community, impacts and benefits and public comment. Uh, we have board established priorities um, and principles for land acquisition. They include uh, principles that are grounded in conservation biology and uh, based on specific priorities that include specific ecosystems, plant communities and species. So all of those guide our evaluation of ecological outcomes. And then we ask specific questions about the project's alignment with each of our evaluation criteria. We use subject matter experts uh, to assist with reviewing applications. And then lastly, each of our grant awards is subject to funding conditions. And the purpose of those is to ensure that issues that are flagged during the application review are resolved, and that increases the odds of, uh, of successful long-term conservation outcomes. So with that context provided, I'll tell you a little bit about how we look at project outcomes. Uh, we periodically monitor our easement interests to ensure uh, landowner compliance with the easements, but the monitoring is not intended to be, and it's not structured as effectiveness monitoring. Um, our compliance-focused monitoring relates back to evaluating organizational capacity during the grant application process. And um, what I mean is in the application, we, we specifically ask questions about the grantees management plans, their property inspection protocols and stewardship activities um, to address the potential for sex successful conservation outcomes. So we look at the information provided to gauge the odds that the project is going to deliver on the on the proposed results. 
Um, we ask, for example, if restoration is needed. Um, we ask grantees to articulate desired future conditions and their plan for achieving those conditions. Um, and we require uh, a stewardship funding calculator to be provided with the application. And we ask folks to give us their plan for raising stewardship funds that will help to, to uh, care for the property uh, over the long run. Um, and so although our monitoring centers on easement compliance, it does provide information about project outcomes. So that stewardess, um, and feel free anyone from the committee to speak up, but um, I, I want to know what that stewards funding calculator was. Was that like talking about match or something in that sense? No, a stewardship funding calculator essentially is a fancy spreadsheet that that our partners use and there's we don't dictate format there's a lot of different calculators out there land trusts for example sometimes have their own format the nature conservancy has produced a template that folks can use as well but what what applicants put into that spreadsheet is an accounting a list of all of the the actions they think they'll need to take periodically on the property and so things like replacing gates uh, installing fencing, installing signage, uh, dealing with emerging weed threats, those sorts of things that are kind of care and feeding of a property over time. Those are all plugged into that sheet. They estimate what they're going to need over time in terms of funds. And then they calculate a essentially a stewardship endowment that will be invested to produce income to care for the property over time. Oh, that's great to know. Right, I've got a, a question regarding permanence. So the forest management plan is submitted and uh, say it's approved or whatever the property management plan, because in this case, uh, Senate Bill 1501 states that these conservation easements are to be on lands other than forest lands. So the property management plan, what what mechanism is there on behalf of OWEB if that plan is not being executed as presented? Uh, or f another example would be, say, a group owns the property now, but they've identified a different piece of property they believe would provide more uplift or more in alignment with their own goals. So they decide to sell the one property that was funded through OWEB to gain another. What what mechanisms do you have to prevent that? Those are good questions. Thank, thanks for posing those. Um, so really, the answer comes back down to our conservation easement and just to provide a little differentiation here when we fund the outright purchase of land by our grantee we are granted we owe Weber granted a conservation easement on that land that easement contains provisions one of them being that a management plan is required for the property OWEB needs to approve it, and once it's approved, it needs to be implemented. Of course, we work with our grantees if there is a problem with implementing a management plan. First and foremost, that's our approach uh, to, to talk with people, to work with them, to try to figure out what's going on. We could enforce our easement to require them to, to implement their management plan. Um, definitely not our desired approach. Uh, and then the other question, Chad, you had was about essentially about land swaps. And the easy yeah. answer there is that our easement and statute uh, prohibit that. We're set up as a competitive grant program for purchasing property interests. Land swaps are outside of that of our authority and we can't we can't do those. So our easement mm -hmm. will prohibit those. Gotcha. So OWEB is an easement holder in and of itself. We we are when we help grantees to purchase property in fee we are granted an easement the the differentiation is that when an applicant comes to us and asks for funding to buy a conservation on private land which is i understand the committee is most interested in then oweb takes a third party right to enforce that easement and that's an important distinction because we are we are not granted that easement we are not technically a party. We just hold the right to enforce that easement. And we have a clear understanding with our grantee that it is their responsibility to monitor, defend, defend, enforce the easement. We really just step in if there is an issue with our grantee accomplishing those outcomes. That's helpful. Thank you, Miriam. Heath, it looks like you've got your hand up there. Yeah, and I've, I've got a couple if it's okay. In that, in that context, Miriam, do you consider yourself 
purchasing an easement or purchasing the land? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends on the project type. So OEBS funds are provided to grantees so that they can purchase land outright or they can purchase an easement. And so we 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 do both. Um, but again, funds are always provided to them. We don't we don't hold land. We don't own land. Um, we will just hold that easement when land is purchased outright, but, or we will have that third party right when an easement is purchased. I hope that helps. That relates. I mean, that relates kind of to my second question of how do you grapple with like competing projects? I could envision, you know, two identical projects. Well, two projects, both of which propose to protect a mile of stream. And we can talk about what protect means, but both of them are protecting a mile of stream. One of them requires you acquire 20 acres, and one of them requires you acquire 10 acres. In both circumstances, both are only a mile of stream. How do you grapple with quantifying the conservation uplift associated with what is in effect, I guess, the conservation easement to which OEB is a beneficiary, where one project may be much more expensive than the other project for the same level of conservation. Do you try to quantify the amount of conservation? Do you have a, a rubric or metric by which you develop a common understanding of the amount of conservation that your dollars are buying? How do you how do you score all that? Those are great questions. Those are those are complicated questions. We don't have a rubric. We don't score. Um, we engage in, of course, a substantive comparison of all of the applications we might receive in a, in a cycle, um, because we may at times have a funding line where you know we can't fund all of them. But there is not a, a formula or a, a, a sense of mechanics, if you will, in comparing one application to the other. We do have a set of evaluation criteria. And the thing about those criteria is that they're all interrelated. So oftentimes it's the way in which <clears throat> those criteria come together that will help us to make our funding decisions. So for example, if properties are a little bit different in ecological outcomes, but one is facing a significant title issue that might make it difficult to accomplish the ecological outcomes, it may be more advantageous to OEP to fund the one with fewer soundness considerations in time and see if the second one comes back to us after soundness considerations have been addressed. I know that may not get exactly at your question, but I hope it, it may helps. Just a, it may close and mark if I may, but before I do, Renee, you may have more to add on that. Thanks, Heath. I, Miriam went where I was going, which is I think the importance of um, thinking through the evaluation criteria and the interplay among those. Um, because in the event that a funding line would need to be drawn, it's really challenging to to when um, projects are have the potential to deliver similar ecological outcomes or hold similar values. It, it this is the challenge I, I think in in grant making, whether it's restoration or acquisition. How do you how do you compare those two things when both has value? But I think that's where looking. Um, in total at the various evaluation criteria that you all will have for this program might help to pop a certain project. Um, it doesn't diminish the value of another. It's just in a resource constrained space. You may have to have to um, make some of those challenging decisions. And, yeah, and on the, the, the way evaluation that, criteria. Yep. The way that I've been grappling with it and this will come back to this, but I you know, we and we as a group may come back to this later, but I can imagine two identical ranches and two proposals on one proposal. It proposes that we pay enough money to fence all the creeks on the ranch and they're identical ranches. And the other proposal is we fence all the creeks on the ranch and we buy the ranch. Right in both circumstances, you are fencing identical creeks. It's just one strategy is spectacularly more expensive than the other because it includes like a fee simple acquisition component. And that's where I've been kind of, you know, kind of wrestling around with this. But for my last one, I guess, and this should be quicker, the uh, Miriam, uh, imagine a circumstance where you have a project that has 
you know, 10 units of conservation uplift associated with it. Like you're going to see this amount of conservation uplift and there are several funders associated with it. And let's imagine that there are two funders, each of which are contributing a million dollars and you're contributing ten dollars. How much conservation uplift do you think in that circumstance that OWEB is accomplishing? That's a great and, and complex question. Um, we again, because we don't tend, we don't quantify uplift. We don't look at it in terms of units return for dollars invested. We look at the overall project and to some extent, the our philosophy is if this project isn't worth investing our funds in we want to see comprehensive and compelling outcomes we typically contribute quite a bit of money these days to um, transactions in the, the realm of millions of dollars. And so that removes a bit of that consideration he, yeah. from, from our minds when we're making those decisions. Thanks for being generous, Mark. Uh, sorry for all the questions. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I was going to go in a slightly different direction. First, Miriam and Renee, thanks for being here today. Nice to see you both. Um, Miriam, sort of from more of a transactional standpoint, can you describe a little bit uh, when OA participates in either fee simple or an easement? Is it usually, are there other funding sources that are going to the applicant? Um, and is it, how do you as a one funder, and maybe there's other state or federal funders involved, kind of share or cooperate in the due diligence? Or how does that, does OEB always do its own due diligence, whether it's $10 or $2 million, regardless of the project size, or sometimes are there sort of economies of scale, of, say there's some forest legacy money involved also, and so ODF has to do something, or land and water conservation. How, how do the, from a transactional standpoint, how do you work through those types of projects? That, that's a good question. I think the most basic answer is that for a variety of reasons, OWEB needs to do its do and rely on its own due diligence. We require certain things of an applicant and we review them to the standards that are appropriate for ensuring outcomes with our consistent with our grant purpose. And so for I, I say that in a somewhat vague way, the, the, the way in which that can pertain is um, different funders have different purposes and different things may create due diligence due diligence headaches for us than for them. And so we need to look at due diligence through an OWEB specific lens. That said, we routinely share the outcomes of our due diligence with others, and we consult with other funding entities on a project as to what their perspectives are on due diligence that's been gathered. And so if that that's helpful. In the case, suppose there are some ODF forest legacy money involved, estate money. Is there sort of as one state agency to another? Are are there similar due diligence levels between what ODF would do and what OEB would do, or or maybe forest legacy? I mean, or state parks if they were to acquire land, you know, do they look at the same due diligence that OEB does, or are there differences among the state agencies? It comes, I think it really comes down to the source of funding and what the program purposes are. There are, there's a lot of overlap between due diligence items, um, between agency, between agencies, but again, the lens through which they view those items may be a bit different. And that comes down to the purpose of funding to some extent. It looks like Renee is both nodding and has her hand up here. She may be able to add more. Yeah, thanks, Miriam, and thanks for the question, Mark. I would agree with what Miriam stated. I think it is um, dependent on which program you're talking about. I do absolutely think there is overlap and um, trying to figure out, we're in the midst of this right now with standing up the Drinking Water Source Protection Program and thinking about, um, for example, local partners, water suppliers that would be interfacing with Department of Environmental Qualities, State Revolving Fund, and determining where is their overlap and hopefully some efficiencies for the on-the-ground partners, whether it's a land trust and 
in the case of what we're talking about today, or a water supplier with drinking water source protection, and where are those the, there are nuances, either because of statute or rule, where it is um, it's a, an additional body of work. Um, and so I think just trying to recognize where those cases exist, but at the same time ensuring that from a an accountable public funder standpoint, we're um, doing our due diligence. Um, and recognizing that other agencies may be in the same boat, but trying to, you know, hopefully leverage things like appraisal reviews where that makes sense, preliminary title reports, um, so that folks aren't doing entirely different bodies of work for four different funding sources. But Sarah hopefully has a great answer and response. Yeah, I guess. Um, thanks. Um, go ahead. Um, Chair Washington and members of the committee. Good afternoon, Sarah Reif, the Habitat Division Administrator with ODFW, helping manage and support this program with Andy. Um, and Renee and Miriam, thank you so much for being here and taking the time, really appreciate all the years of experience and wisdom that we're able to benefit from here as we're trying to navigate our way to a, a framework that's workable for PFA. And I guess, I had a real brass tax question um, on the due diligence piece. And, and for those that aren't familiar with that term, that's where you do things like appraisals and, you know, maybe environmental surveys or some of the other components that go along with an acquisition or an easement. Who, who pays for the due diligence work? Does that come out of the grant? Does that come out of your own administrative budgets? And then I have, if if the chair will indulge me, I do have one other question. Yeah, that, yeah. that's fine. Sorry. That's a good question. So the our applicants are responsible for generating the due diligence product. So for example, they need to obtain the appraisal. We incur costs in, in reviewing and approving that appraisal. The nuance here is that OEB restructures land acquisition program in 2013 to enable our applicants to include due diligence costs in their project budgets. So for okay. example, once they have an approvable appraisal, we can reimburse them for it if it's in their project budget. No, Very it strictly helpful. be retroactive, correct, Miriam? So that it would be a bit of a risk that they would be incurring these costs with no guarantee of funding. That is an explicit understanding on the part of OEB. We recognize that as taking, um, I should say, informed and reasonable risks in terms yeah. of funding projects, recognizing we will put money into due diligence. We are careful in the way we do it. So, for example, if we have a significant concern about title, we don't ask them to go out and get an appraisal first because appraisals are expensive. So we say, hey, please fix the issue, resolve the issue with regard to title, then go get your appraisal and we'll pay you for that. But they are calculated risks, and there is a chance that the, the the transaction will not work out, and we will have parted with due diligence funds. Very good. Um, next, we've got Mark. Yeah, I was curious if you could give a sense of you know how many acquisition trans transactions, be it fee simple or easement, does OF do in a biennium, on average? Oh goodness, it depends on the biennium. Um, sure. typically I would say between 10 and 12. Again, depends on the year. COVID times were slow. Uh, there's a lot of variation, but that's also, I'll tell you that's my average, Mark. Yeah, and, and partly why I asked, that's helpful. Obviously, OEB has a lot of experience with this. And so I guess the idea I'm exploring in my own thinking is, you know, if PFA was to fund a fee simple project or acquisition or easement, I'm guessing there might be one or two in a biennium. Maybe, maybe there'd be more, but there probably wouldn't be very many. One or two seems like a good guess or so, a few. And I'm wondering if, you know, rather than having PFA have to sort of stand up a whole acquisition program, you know, the idea of having an MOU between ODF and W and the PFA program with OWEB to manage the acquisition of those one or two acquisitions in a given biennium, obviously with some resources to provide the capacity with OEB to do it. But th that's sort of where my mind was going, given sort of that I don't think PFA is going to have a lot of easements or acquisition projects. Not to say it won't have any, but 
think you may be surprised, Mark, when people are looking to use funds to match Forest Legacy uh, program funds. Uh, but we can address that as it comes up or doesn't. Yeah. Thanks, Mark, for that. I think Renee might have some comments on on shared shared resources, if I understood your your question correctly. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Good. Yeah, I'm happy to chime in. And I actually have one quick comment to um, to Sarah's question. So, Mark, I um, I think that what you're describing is logical, and I think that going back to the statutory foundation that I mentioned for the multiple land transaction programs that we have now is critically important. What is similar? What is different? What are expectations on the ground with local partners? What's what are expectations of the proponents initially of the legislation of this committee, um, because our um, each of those acquisitions programs has some uniquenesses. And so it could be that if PFA has certain expectations, it may or may not fit within the framework of how traditional Measure 76 land acquisitions are implemented at OWEB. So I think that will be probably an important consideration for this committee. Um, where is that overlap and where are some of those differences possibly? Um, and just briefly, Sarah, I, you may not have asked a two-part question, so um, I may be answering something you didn't ask, but in addition to the due diligence being reimbursable, as Miriam described, there are, and she mentioned this briefly, there are due diligence costs that the agency incurs for things like appraisal, reviews, due diligence, contractor support, Department of Justice. Um, support on that. And so that piece um, that is our our due diligence um, on top of our review process is something that comes out of agency operations. So I want to make sure just from an agency to agency perspective, you're accounting for those costs too, depending on the structure of your process. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Heath, you've got your hand up. I didn't know if Andy, he usually has insightful topical things to add. I, did you have something, Andy? Uh, I, I appreciate that, Heath. Um, but no, I'll go after you as another question. Okay. So I, I just have another question regarding kind of the structure that you've described at OWEB. I, it's it's kind of weird to me. I, I haven't been exposed to uh, land acquisitions with conservation funds in this manner. Um, the It feels like, you know, given my hypothetical earlier, you're taking a conservation measure or a conservation easement that says the fences, the creeks will be fenced. And it's just, it's an agreement that says uh, for this period of time, you will keep the creeks fenced. And then in connection with that, ownership of the land for a fee simple project transfers from A to B, right? That is to say for maybe the rancher to the land trust. But what you're getting is you're getting a conservation easement that says you'll keep the fence, the cricks fenced and you can enforce that over time if you need to, but you are not otherwise the owner of the property. And my, my question for you is, what do you think you are accomplishing by transferring ownership from A to B? That is to say, all of the conservation uplift, it seems to me, resides in the conservation easement that you took why is it what are you accomplishing by transferring ownership as between two otherwise non-public parties that's that's a good question Heath. so one of the the i think most significant answers to your question is what's intended for the property after the interest is purchased typically if large-scale restoration is intended on a property it's it's better to have that the property purchased in fee. So a, an easy example is a diked uh, former tidal wetland on the coast that was diked years ago, you know, levees, tide gates for um, agriculture, for, for livestock production. And over time, that infrastructure tends to fail, the property is less productive, and someone wants to restore that. We have partners who have done a fantastic job yeah. of that work. It, there, it does not make a lot of sense for a private landowner to hold title to property that is fundamentally altered and being returned to title wetland. So that's an easy example as an answer. And in that circumstance, um, 
you're saying that the private landowner would not want to hold that property any longer. That is to say, in effect, analytically, they're giving it to the land trust for free, that the purchase is the conservation work you're doing, or is the landowner being compensated for something that they would otherwise keep if they wouldn't have been paid for it? Landowners in our program are always compensated for uh, the transfer of property interests. Typically, and I hope I'm going to answer your question here, typically land trusts want to own and fee simple properties that they are extensively restoring. It's administratively easier not to have another party involved, for example. And typically landowners don't find it useful to make to retain title to property that's that they have agreed will be so fundamentally altered by another party that it is not useful to them and they would retain certain Fair costs enough. and responsibilities that they may not want to. I think that's right. That that may be true. That and that's a different circumstance though than my example where you're buying a you know a, a 500 acre ranch in order to fence a mile of cricks. Uh, that may be a very expensive way to accomplish that objective. I I agree, and that's not typically how OWEB's fee simple projects look. Um, the easement that we're granted covers the entire property. The entire property is expected to produce conservation outcomes as a as a whole. And so, yes, I agree with you. What you're describing seems like it would be an expensive way to achieve creek conservation of the creek. And so then, you know, it would merit grappling then with the degree to which, you know, land trust ownership of that property is merited in any individual circumstance versus just taking a conservation easement for the conservation measures you're uh, trying to accomplish. I think that as as y'all are thinking through how to structure land acquisition offerings, those that's something that you would need to consider. Thanks. Thank you, Miriam. So we've got Andy and then Renee, and then I've got a, a question as well to follow up after Renee. So go ahead, Andy. Um, yeah, Renee, I was going to give you the opportunity if you were responding to Heath there, you're welcome to to go ahead and I can follow up. I, I was, Andy. Um, thank mm -hmm. you for that. Heath, I think this um, this is where looking at the full portfolio and the full set of options, really, as I think about OWEB's program. So we foundationally we have an extensive restoration program i mean that is paired with things like engagement and technical assistance and so i think it's figuring out what is possible with always with willing landowners that is a core premise of our program is um, interest of a landowner to engage in x or y or z and so having these different tools and and opportunities really some might just be a restoration project that is an extensive fencing project it could be very expensive that comes through our restoration program does it have permanence no you hope that it delivers ecological benefits absolutely there within land acquisition is fee option and there also is an easement option given that with each landowner, I think that's where local partners, land trusts, others will be working through. What is the appetite and interest of an individual landowner to, to stay engaged maybe? And it is an easement situation versus maybe a fee situation where something has evolved with their thinking, their life situation, and, and they're considering other options potentially. But I think for, for us at OWEB, that's such a core piece is really that opportunity for local partners to be engaging with landowners to talk through what is the need opportunity and where are some of those no-go spaces. But your objective is not to transfer ownership of lands out of private ownership into land trust ownership. Your objective is to realize certain conservation objectives. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm. Very helpful. Um, so a pretty easy question. I mean, there's a lot of work that's apparent on both sides. Uh, there's front load work from the applicant and then on the back end for OWEB. Is there some kind of pre-application filter that OWEB initiates so that applicants can get to a checkpoint and they're not doing, you know, a crazy amount of work ahead of time? We have a required pre-application consultation process. The goal 
of that is to ensure that OWEB and the prospective applicant are on the same page as to what the project looks like and what the fit might be for OWEB funding and all the various due diligence considerations they might want to embark on before they submit an application. It's really just about trying to ensure that if folks do opt to, to submit an application, it is a quality and competitive application. We don't screen out any project at that pre-application consultation um, stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Well, this is all very helpful. And just a reminder to everybody, we've got about 10 minutes before we're going to move to the next discussion item. Uh, but before we do, Andy, can you remind me when we're going to open our next solicitation? Um, October 1. October 1. So that is about six months, uh, a week shy. Is that correct? So Miriam and Renee, you've been involved with this OWEB process for quite some time and have a lot of experience. How reasonable, in your opinion, which is probably the most professional here in this meeting, is it to establish a program and administer these funds to a project of this type in six months, given two agency staff members and a handful of volunteers? Is this optimistic or is this easily done? Or I would just like to get your thoughts. Mary, um, would you like to go first? In my experience, I, I would say that is optimistic. Renee, we have a, a recent example of trying to stand up grant programs in relatively short time frames, and perhaps you can speak more specifically to Chad's question. Yeah, thanks, Miriam. Um, I agree that it's optimistic. Is it impossible? No. I mean, some of the examples that Miriam mentioned, we, the web received post-fire recovery funding, drought relief funding that we needed to stand up very quickly and it was possible. Mm -hmm. And a, a key piece of that was leveraging um, existing processes um, and experience. And so I mentioned earlier, and, and I, I don't, you may have already had these conversations, so apologies if I'm re-plowing old ground, but conversations with the Willamette Wildlife Mitigation Program folks at ODFW. If you have some muscle memory within the agency, if you have processes that you can borrow and lean on that are already known um, within the agency's operations, that is eminently helpful. Um, I've mentioned the Drinking Water Source Protection Pro Program. That's a bit different because we were required to go through rulemaking. So that definitely is taking more time in terms of program stand up. I think from end of rulemaking to launch, we're looking at about six months. Um, and again, leveraging our existing um, processes. Um, so I think it's possible, but yes, your your two devoted staff will, will be busy um, given that they're also administering restoration and, and other grants. And that also brings up the point that Mark Stern made uh, a good one and how do we leverage the existing capacity of OWEB through maybe some type of agreement or uh, an MOU and whatever structure that looks like. I thought that was a, a good idea. So if we were to go down that road or open it for discussion, it sounds like you have had time to review Senate Bill 1501 and the items pertaining to what acquisitions look like under our statutory authority. This seems to me like it matches the Oregon Ag Agricultural Heritage Program closest. Um, would you see this being able to go under that program with provisions or would it be a new program that OWEB would uh, look to establish? Yeah, Chair Washington, thanks for that. So um, full admission, I um, I perused the bill quite quickly, <laughs> so I want to just put that caveat on it. Um, I, in terms of, I believe the intent of the PFA program is more focused on easements rather than fee. That may be correct. It may be incorrect. That if that is the case, then that's where Oregon Ag Heritage Program has uh, more comparability, I would say. And I do believe that the statutory foundation is such an important consideration that I wouldn't say yes. This could absolutely just pour pour over to OHP because we have. 
um, specific evaluation criteria as an example that are very focused on that program. I think you would need something comparable. Um, so I, 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 um, I'm not trying to um, be dismissive at all, but just really don't want to lose that important piece of what was the expectation and directive to the agency um, and how do you get there in terms of, of what the ultimate intent of the PFA mitigation program was for the acquisitions piece. Yeah, I think you've hit on a critical piece that we are likely going to have very different goals and objectives than any existing program. Um, but they do have some experience there, so I think that's something we can continue to discuss. Uh, we've got five minutes left, and I see both Sarah and Heath have their hand up. So, we'll, Sarah, would you like to ask a question? Just with the limited time we have left, uh, we um, did not touch on this, but our our statute speaks to conservation easements on land other than forest land, as we've been discussing. It also talks about acquisition of existing water rights for conversion into in-stream water rights. And we haven't really talked about water acquisitions. However, that is also um, you know, part of OWEB's portfolio. And um, it may be worthy of a, another um, invitation to you all to come explore that more deeply, but could we get a, a thumbnail description of what your um, water acquisition program is and how active it is, how much interest. I, I my sense is that um, that is, uh, there is not a lot of on the ground capacity among organizational capacity out there uh, for water acquisitions, but just sort of curious what the level of interest, I guess, is the way to ask that question. What has the level of interest been in your program? Yeah, thanks for that question, Sarah. And we're happy to talk more at another time about the water acquisitions program. So during uh, 2022 legislative session, there was an influx of $10 million in funding in the drought resilience package for water acquisitions. Um, I would say we are seeing reasonable demand on the program. Um, we actually, next week at the Connect Conference, um, our water acquisitions coordinator is partnering with some others to have a water acquisitions 101 um, mm -hmm. session, essentially, mm -hmm. because there has been some interest expressed from Watershed Council, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, Land Trust, other nonprofits to better understand what do those projects look like. Um, and I would say as a state, we are a bit organizational capacity <laughs> limited currently. It, I know Vice Chair Rivard, it's unfortunate she's not here. TU is um, currently working in that space around the state. Um, and there aren't a lot of other folks doing that. Um, I would say not unlike what we've talked about with land acquisitions, the program has openness to different instruments. There are permanent transfers. There are um, different lengths. Uh, leases that can come in. There are other protective instruments um, that are possibilities. There have been some creative voluntary curtailment programs and projects in 15 Mile Creek, for example, in the mid-Columbia. So I think there are some learnings there that we're happy to share if it's helpful. Wonderful. That'd be great. Good. Thank you. Well, I am going to try to keep us on time, but we have two questions from committee members left, and I know that Bob has not had a chance to ask a question yet. So Heath, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to give Bob a chance to ask a question, then we'll come back to you to wrap up. Sounds good. All right, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, okay, I got my voice on. Yeah, I, I don't have a question, just, just a comment. I mean, just as a member of part of the negotiating team, I always expected that acquisition was going to be part of the mitigation program. And I think it is an important piece of the puzzle. So I just don't wanna lose that. Um, how we do it and when we do it's really important, but um, it, it's what I want to lose that, you know, I think this is a, a legitimate piece of the puzzle and, and there was some expe expectation raised around this as well. Um, so just to kind of throw in that perspective. Great, thank you, Bob. And that's clearly outlined in Senate Bill 1501 and we will uh, pull that up after we're done with the OEB folks here uh, to review just kind of the sideboards of what we're talking about when we're talking about acquisitions. And then we can be creative within that space uh, between those sideboards. So Heath, uh, you've got a, a comment or a less, question? Less, less uh, real quick question for you guys. The uh, 
you know, I don't know a lot about conservation grants per se, but but I am a real estate lawyer. Uh, are you, do you have like a contract with DOJ? You know, conservation easements have been some, I've been involved in some pretty complicated instruments there. Um, who helps you with your real estate kind of transactional work? What, how do you manage that? And how would we, if we did it? That is a, a, a great question. We have under contract, uh, typically one to two real property experts who will work with me on easement drafting. Uh, we require our applicants, our grantees to provide a draft. However, there's it's, it's typically early days on the draft and there's quite a bit of work to be done. The Department of Justice does serve as our attorney and in the end, um, the easement needs to go to, to them for legal sufficiency review. So it is a team. There are a lot of easements out there that are complicated and they take a lot of care. And so in that context, Andy and Sarah, it seems like you'll need budget for both the kind of development work on the transactional side, whether that's an expert or a lawyer, and then you'll need budget at DOJ for kind of buttoning up that work as well. Correct. Yeah. And we are we we do a similar thing work with DOJ too on other stuff, but yeah. Any other questions for Renee or Miriam? With that, I'd like to thank you both for your time. It's been really helpful, and I'm sure we will be reaching out again, uh, likely many times, as we seek to get this established in six months, last one week. Pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Take care. All right. So with that, we will move to the committee acquisition discussion uh, agenda item. But before we do, Andy, are you able to pull up uh, Senate Bill 1501 on screen <coughs> just so that we can all take a look together? Yeah, give me just a quick second. I have it right here. I'll drag over and share screen. I know it was distributed to the committee members um, in the meeting materials. Oh, France got her printed out. Very good. Um, Specifically, Andy, I think we're looking at page 12 of of that document. Uh, section 32 here should be coming on screen now for you, Chad. Yep. Uh, yes, yeah, so. Looks like it starts at. Uh, sub. H, is that correct? No, G. Um, it's a kind of a small screen here, Andy. So I'll just go ahead and read it uh, to the best of my ability. There we go. Oh, back up one. There you go. Um, so again, just a little level setting before we open the committee acquisition discussion. And I think that by staying within our statutory authority and working in that space, it'll allow us to have more productive conversation as well as come up with some creative solutions to this uh, time sensitive. Uh, work ahead of us. So a reminder, what we've been tasked with is to support the establishment of conservation easements on land other than forest land to protect riparian areas. We've also been tasked with supporting acquisition of an existing water right for conversion to an in-stream water right, as described in ORS 537.348, to improve the in-stream flow conditions. So that's kind of what we're talking about when we're talking about acquisitions. Um, and I think that as long as we're all clear on our statutory authority, we're going to have some really productive conversation. Um, with that, we've got Mark, uh, you've got a question. But go ahead. Well, yeah, I, I see what we just read and I see your point there. I would go down to uh, letter K on it, though, which was the last provision that said or other actions or activities that would. And again, I don't have it up on the screen anymore, but said. Basically benefit. Aquatic or riparian. Uh, interests. Yeah, very good. Thank you, Mark. So I guess to me that. That's kind of an open door. Um, 
it just says other activities. So land acquisition could potentially be one of those activities if it met those goals. Yep, I think that uh, meeting those goals is critical. I also think that it was pretty explicitly outlined regarding acquisition. And so to go uh, and say that other acquisition items that are not explicitly stated uh, would of course be included as an item for discussion. Go ahead, Heath. Mark, were you done? Yeah, I guess I would also say, you know, I wasn't part of the authors group there, but I think it'd be interesting to hear from uh, Kristen and Bob and Heath, you too, I guess all three of you were part of that group. And my impression is land acquisition was talked about pretty extensively in those conversations, but I wasn't there. So I guess I'd defer to the three of you on what the flavor or expectations were around that topic. Yeah, it was mostly me and Kristen, and I would say that land acquisitions were not prominently discussed. If they were, I, it would have made me nervous and there would have been more finagling about it. But suffice it to say, you know, the 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 report itself kind of captures it. The you know, the report the report itself talks about and this is the part that we actually drafted, right? That was like we all worked together on that and in the relevant section, you know, the there's kind of four categories we highlighted and category two was land preservation, those those which is different words, right? And uh, you scroll down to the land preservation section and it says, you know, the HEP handbook describes land preservation as a quote mechanism for preventing the impacts of development threats to covered species and their habitats on a particular property. And it says the authors identified the following mitigation efforts related to land preservation for the purposes of the PFA. And it gives just one A. It says conservation easements. Riparian conservation easements outside of the covered lands may be used to mitigate impacts associated with timber practices. Easements on covered lands may be useful to help small forest landowners comply with new standards. And so, you know, again, as as kind of like from the real estate attorney perspective, like the dividing line between what is a conservation easement and what is a land acquisition is kind of like what is property, right? Like I, it's it's a pretty academic question, but and I think that there's room for us to have this conversation. But for me, you know, I unlike Bob, I had not anticipated acquisition for acquisition's sake, and maybe Bob didn't say that. He did not explicitly say that, but I didn't. I didn't see that as being the objective. I saw the objective being conservation uplift for the covered species, right? And I think back on the projects that we were just presented with, and uh, I, I look back at those streams and like imagine all the ones we looked at where they were going to add large woody debris right they're going to add large wood to these streams and they're going to create some pools and pull out some culverts in what universe does it make any sense to also acquire the tract of land right on any of those projects that i reviewed it just didn't none of them stood out to me as being like the conservation uplift is associated with the conservation investments we're making acquisition of land itself in my view doesn't actually accomplish anything and i thought that miriam made a good point about circumstances where look this is going to be so intensive or so involved relative to that particular parcel that you can't really get the work done without owning the land and that that seems to me to highlight some opportunity there in the fee acquisition space but otherwise i didn't actually see a project like that presented and that's probably because we didn't solicit you know land acquisition uh uh, uh applications but uh i just i look at it and say you know i'm very concerned about if our objective is, is to fence the creek a proposal to buy the ranch doesn't make any sense to me. And that's at one extreme, but I think to the degree that we can agree that's true, then I think that informs much of the rest of our work. Under what circumstances does it make sense to acquire the land? And I would propose that's those would be limited circumstances. Thank you, Heath. Uh, Bob, you've got your hand up. Would you like to chime in yeah. here and then we'll, we'll go to Mark and then I've got uh, some comments as well after Mark. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with Ethan looking at the same page she's looking at in the, uh, the uh, BFA Accords. Uh, and it does very explicitly call out easements. Um, there's only, there, there, there are two things listed there. There's one. Uh, and, and it could have listed acquisition as well. Uh, up higher, it does talk about land preservation as one of the categories that you, the agencies look at for um, mitigation. And it, at the bottom, as Mark notes, we do have the catch-all category as well. You know, so I guess the way I read that, um, and and again, I was in part of these direct discussions. Heath was. Um, I was on the periphery. Uh, was that it doesn't rule it out. Uh, it also doesn't highlight it as a priority either. Um, and and I, I don't disagree with Heath's um, analysis that I, I think the vast majority of cases we're, we're not going to want to own the land. You know, it's not a situation where you're going to want to want to buy it. Uh, you're just going to want to make sure it's restored. And land acquisition can eat up a hell of a lot of money fast as well. There's only so much that you're going to do. Uh, and so I guess I'm trying to straddle a line here, though, because I, I don't think it's ruled out either. I think there could be cases where it makes sense. I agree. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think we were maybe converging at the end of our statements on the same place. And so I guess I'm interested in sort of how do you, how do you keep it alive? Um, I, I think the the weight is on easements for sure. Um, but, uh, you know, how, how, do, how do we not preclude that opportunity as well? How do, how do you build that in or do you? Um, anyways, I'll stop there. Thank you for that, Bob. Uh, Mark, I welcome you to add your comments and thoughts and I have some follow-up. Well, I, I think Keith and Bob were sort of converging on the same point there, and I was just going to give an example of where a land acquisition sort of might make sense. As Keith, the example you gave, clearly it doesn't make sense, but I, I think the point really being is that uh, a land acquisition would really have to clearly demonstrate that there were benefits to these covered species that couldn't otherwise be achieved and that the investment, the conservation uplift, however we assess that was worth the lift, so to speak. And I think the onus will be on the applicants to make the case for that, and then we can see how it falls. Thank you for that, Mark. And um, I'll just say, my concern lies in <clears throat> these funds being used. Uh, well, I'll give an example. Bob, during our last meeting, you made the mention that it felt like some of the amphibian projects were kind of an afterthought or amphibians were just kind of added to the list as a, a cherry on top of a project. And I would hate to see our acquisitions viewed as the benefit to the covered species as just, oh, and there may be some trout in this creek as well. But really we want to acquire this for a different reason. And we see this new pool of money as potential match to access other pools of money. And by the way, there are some amphibians near the stream. So I just would hate to see uh, it go that direction. And I do want to go back to, uh, you know, the HCP handbook talks about limiting development threats. And so I see, given our land use laws here in Oregon and the development threats in riparian areas are pretty limited unless we're talking about areas other than forested landscapes outside of EFU ground where a conservation easement to prevent the development which I think we can all agree benefits these aquatic species I, I just would like to see more emphasis and work done in those areas where we have common goals common understanding and not get too hung up on some of these exceptions or the what ifs but I think that it's possible. Uh, Bob, you've got a comment. Yeah, so let me offer just a couple of examples where I think it could become germane. Because, because again, I, I agree with everything you said, Chad. I, I don't think that uh, most of these are going to make sense. But the, the grant that I think of, and they weren't asking for this, but it's an example of something, is, is when you start to intersect with education, um, for example, and the Beaver grant, um, which we did not fund, uh, where they wanted to put kind of an interpretive center and beaver education next to a wetland and the property was available. And, you know, again, they weren't asking us to acquire the property per se, but I could see, I could see something like that where there's kind of a primo site, there's an educational public engagement piece of the puzzle where there's a reason to want to have fee simple ownership of a small parcel. 
Um, I, I can see some other I can see other examples like that as well popping up. I can think of um, uh, there's there's an objective in the PFA to do beaver relocation. Uh, in order to do that, you actually need to hold beaver um, and match them up and get them used to being with each other before you introduce them. Otherwise, they don't tend to survive. I can see acquiring a small piece of land for that purpose. Um, a lot of this stuff can probably be put on somebody else's land in some sort of 100-year agreement or something like that. But I, I think there are actually real tangible examples that could pop up. They're limited, uh, but they're there. Thank you for that, Bob. And, you know, sure. I, I guess that is an important consideration when we're looking at building this out. What are the areas we want to leave open for those exceptions? Recognizing that we probably don't need to build the whole program around an exception or a what if, um, but take those ad hoc as they come. Yeah, no, those are great examples. Really... Yeah, I mean, so I'm, that's what I'm trying to think about is how do you leave some of those open where in some ways the the land is essential to the activity, a, you know, getting at your concern about, you know, salamanders being add-ons, um, uh, not we want to own the land and we'll do some cool work on it, but rather land is the essential piece of this puzzle and also perhaps limiting the I, I don't know in other ways as well maybe the amount of money that can be available for that um anyways that's that's yeah. where i'm thinking i think we need to be careful there as well i was provided an example earlier today about what if there say were a strip mine um that ne if a conservation easement was placed on that strip mine and it prevented all of the chemical effluent from going into the stream maybe we don't want to cap the money available if there were a, an instance like that but um yeah i don't know it, it, a lot of work for the work group um, but heath would you like to uh, add your comments here yeah well i'm glad you mentioned a, a work group I, I i it seems like that's probably worthwhile the you know one of the i, I still think it's worth grappling some with you know, that question I asked about, you know, imagine, you know, a $3 million project that produces 30 units of conservation uplift and there's three funders each at a million dollars. Do each of them claim all 30 units of conservation uplift, right? That is to say, do each of them, uh, and is in that circumstance, is that million dollars producing all of that conservation uplift for the three million dollar project or is that million dollars competing with another million dollar project that may itself be producing 20 units of conservation uplift that is to say and obviously we're not going to quantify things in that manner that would be very difficult here but i think that coupling our investments with other investments we run the risk that we invest in very expensive outcomes. That is to say, if you take all of the combined investments and compare them to the uplift that you are realizing, it may be much less on a per dollar basis than a smaller project that you would invest in yourself. And I just, I feel like as a group, we need to grapple with that some because I think it's really seductive to kind of put your little piece in a big federal pie and claim that you did all of that, when in reality, it may be happening anyway. There may be other alternative sources for that funding, and your little piece could be deployed in a specific small watershed that's actually producing more conservation uplift per dollar invested than if you threw your lot in with you know, the rest of them. That's a, and so a I would just point. like to see if we're going to have a work group. I would like to see that work group grapple with that with that question. So it's a great point. And, you know, honestly, I think it's something that we're going to grapple with in every solicitation moving forward regarding, you know, do we add a little bit of funding to get a large project across the line and try to claim what we can as far as conservation uplift? Or is the combination of, say, 10 smaller projects that we are the sole funder of creating greater uplift. And I think we're only going to be able to look at that on a solicitation <laughs> by solicitation basis, but certainly something to keep top of mind in the work group. So thank you for that. Um, Bob, it looks like your hand was up and then we've got Mark. Sorry, Keith and I are playing ping pong here. Um, 
uh, I think the other example too is, is you know, I, I think there are some places that are purely for ecological value. I think of in holdings, and I think that's something else for the work group to grapple with. Uh, in holdings in state forests, things like that, where uh, you do have real threats and, and, and threats of access easements and things like that, where you can get a lot of bang for your buck for getting something off the market and getting it into some sort of more coherent hole. And that may be the one that that, that people are worrying about too. Um, but uh, I think that's a place where uh, we can also be effective with acquisition. Thank you, Bob. Mark? Yeah, Chad, I was just going to second your point, I guess, that the whole question that you, Keith, raised about, you know, adding a small bit of funding to a bigger project or, you know, funding a small project in our entirety, that, that really applies to all of our project types. That's not acquisition specific. It's, I think we faced that question among all the different applicants we got, and we saw it in the last go round as well. So something we can chew on going forward. I agree. I bet it's going to present itself in spades with the uh, with the big federal funds that are available and recently refunded. Yep, and some of the new state funds. Great. Well, I did mention a work group, um, and I guess we should officially talk about that. I, I'd like to propose that we convene a work group um, over the next six months to really refine what this program is going to look like, work with the partner agencies to determine, you know, where can we rely on, on their experience uh, and what this whole process is going to look like. Uh, it will be a lot of work as reiterated by our OWEB friends. Um, so I, I would ask if you want to be a participant in the work group that you come uh, committed to being able to do that work. Um, what are the thoughts from the committee? General support. Concerns. Well, I see a few heads nodding. Uh, Mark, are you getting ready to come off mute? No, I was pretty content nodding my head in support of what you said. Very good. All right. Well, Andy, with that, would you be able to follow up with the committee, uh, kind of soliciting who would be willing to participate in this work group? And I know yeah. that Kristen uh, and Andrew are not here, so I want to make sure that they are aware of what we're talking about, have the opportunity to participate. I know this is an issue that is important with Kristen and want to make sure she has the ability to engage. Yep, sounds good. Um, I'll circulate something and just as a reminder, a work group just creates recommendations. There's no decision being made outside of this committee for those That's records. Right. And a um, work group would be uh, created by the chair and uh and then report back correct we'll report so we'll re report back during these meetings on updates or recommendations on the process i'd recommend um chad a timeline of you know maybe we we have a goal of uh, a draft in early summer or you know early midsummer be able mm -hmm. to assess at that point that's that's what i'm looking at um we can obviously have more discussion later but to meet timelines as we said, we got to get a draft and then probably about two months of considerations with the committee before we. Then, in the spirit of like how we've been doing this work to date, I, you know, I framed that as an appointment by the chair to the work group. I, I guess I would encourage you, Chad, to work closely with Kristen. We've been treating the chair and vice chair as kind of working collaboratively and together, and I hope that persists. Absolutely. I actually, Heath, thank you for mentioning that. I feel like that is a part of why we've been able to be uh, <laughs> successful to date is that um, collaboration between those two. That's what we had with uh, myself and Bob Van Dyke and certainly carrying forward with Kristen Rivard as well. That's great. And I appreciate staff's observation of that as well. Yeah. Of course. All right. Well, I think uh, with that, I'd welcome any other comments or questions by the committee. Our next item is committee closing comment and meeting wrap up. All right, well, that's a talkative bunch. Maybe everybody's just ready to have half an hour of their day returned to them. So um, with that, you know, a great presentation from 
the OWEB staff. Thank you for arranging that, Andy. I personally got a lot out of that. Look forward to working with them more uh, as we build this work group out and attempt to draft a program in six months. Um, I think we had a robust conversation around the acquisitions. Some good points were raised that we can address in that work group. And uh, Andy will follow up to form the work group formally. That's a meeting summary. And with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good day, everyone. Um, thanks. Thank you. Bye, all. Hey, Pran, I am going to.